Hi, this is Samuel with the Physics Focus and the question this week is about wave-particle duality. Now, this is an idea that is really central to the understanding of quantum physics and is also something that a lot of people find quite difficult to get their heads around. To understand this, we're going to start by going back to the beginning of the 1900s. And at that time, physicists understood that there were these two different kinds of things, waves and particles, and waves were waves, and particles were particles. They were different things, they behaved in different ways. And, for example, particles would be things like uh, grains of sand, um, drops of water or other liquid, and characteristics of particles would be that they exist at a specific point in space at any particular time. They, if once you get them moving, they travel in a straight line unless you do something to make them change. And Excuse me, waves, things like water waves, sound waves. Waves spread out from wherever they've been created in all directions. They don't exist in a particular sp place, they spread out, and they do a number of interesting things that particles definitely don't do. For example, if you consider this situation, let's take a piece of card, say, and cut two slits in it. Excuse my drawing. Now, if we send a stream of particles through that, let's say we take an aerosol can, there's an aerosol can of paint and spray it. Some of the paint little paint droplets coming out of there, some of that will hit the card, some of it will go through the gaps. So what you will get on the other side is the image of those two slits, like that. So those little particles, those droplets of paint have gone through, travelled in a straight line, continued going and arrived To form a pattern like that. They don't do anything particularly exciting or unusual. Now, if we do the same thing but with a wave rather than a stream of particles, let's take for example water waves. Now I'm going to turn over. Here we go. So let's say we have Here are some water waves seen from above, and I'm going to put them through a wall with two gaps in it, just like before. Now these waves, when they reach these two gaps, Obviously they're stopped by the wall, but where the two gaps are, they go through. They spread out from there. And they start crossing over each other. And we get 
phenomenon that we call interference. Now this is where the waves cross over, like here, where they coincide, so in this direction here, this direction here, this direction here, etc. The waves from the two slits cross over, add together, we get what we call constructive interference. So you get waves in these directions, the red directions. In between them, let's see, I'll give the directions here in, let's go for yellow. In between, don't know how easy that is to see, where the top of one wave coincides with the bottom of the other wave, you get destructive interference. And so if you're standing over here watching, over on the right, you'll see waves coming in this direction here, and here, and here, and here, and nothing in between, calm water in between. So constructive and destructive interference. Now that's something that only waves do. So water waves, waves on the surface of water, they're clearly waves, they're not particles, or so it was understood. Particles are particles, waves are waves. However, things started to develop from there. So let's think, for example, about light. <clears throat> now, early physicists thought of light as a stream of particles, up until the time of Newton. And because if you shine light through a piece of card with two holes cut in it, you just get two blocks of light coming through. They travel in straight lines, they don't interfere like this. But Newton thought, well, maybe that's because, perhaps that's because, the gaps aren't small enough. Because this effect with water waves, you only get this effect if the gap here, between the two slits, is about the same size as the wavelength of the waves that you're dealing with. It has to be roughly similar. So maybe we're just shining light through two gaps that are just simply too large, too far apart. So he made some very small slits and shone light through them. And he managed to show that you get exactly the same effect. You get interference with visible light. So long as the slits are close enough together. So from that time on, everybody knew that light was also a wave, light waves. But in the early 1900s, some issues with that started to arise. And a number of physicists around that time, including uh, one you might possibly have heard of, called Albert Einstein, suggested that even though light clearly is a wave, it also behaves in some ways as if it's kind of a stream of particles. So let's say, for example, new page, right, we have a source of light here. We have our two slits. Yeah. So the light is going through. If we use a very faint source of light, so there's very little light going through, and we leave this experiment running for a while, and let's say over on the right here in order to collect the results of what we're doing, we use a photographic screen. So that's looking down on the experiment here. We find that as the light goes through, 
we get a little spot developing on the film where the light arrives. And the light always arrives, so we might get, say, a spot there. And then we wait for a little while and we get another spot there. So it looks as if the light is arriving in specific places and at specific times. It's not just a random event. Sorry, it's not just a spread out event. It is random. You never know quite where they're going to arrive. But if you leave it running long enough, it starts to build up a pattern. All right, fast forward here a little bit. Can you see? Even though these little lumps of light, as it looks like they are, are arriving in random positions, when you let enough of them go through, we're still building up this pattern of places where the light is allowed to arrive, like here, and here, and here and places in between where you don't get any light arriving at all, no matter how long you keep it running. So we end up with now this fits exactly with the wave ideas of light. The light is going through these two slits, it's interfering, it's producing constructive interference at the bright patches, destructive interference in between, but it's also arriving bit by bit, one at a time, just as if it's a stream of particles. And this was rather strange. And forced physicists to come to the conclusion that somehow light, even though it clearly is a wave, must also be made up of some kind of packets, at least. Packets of energy. Now we would now refer to these packets of energy as photons of light. Photons. Excuse me. And nowadays we would actually say yes, these are as these are particles. They're not just a way of describing the light. Light does actually exist as a stream of these little parcels. So in some way, they're being created over here, they're travelling through, through these two slits, interfering somehow, deciding where it is that they're allowed to arrive, and then arriving randomly, but at a position that is allowed by the wave interference equations. So somehow, now, if you try to detect which slit they're going through, because, of course, if it's a stream of particles, one particle at a time must either be going through top slit or the bottom slit. So you could put detectors here and you find out one, one photon of light does either go through the top or the bottom, but, of course, by that time you've blocked them off so you don't get the interference pattern. If you let them go through without observing them, you don't know which slit they've gone through, you do get an interference pattern. So a photon of light, and we can turn down the light here so it's dim enough that we can be pretty sure we're only ever getting one photon of light coming through at a time. That one photon goes through, somehow knows that there are two slits here, works out where it's allowed to arrive, as in it's quite likely here, it's not very likely here, it's impossible in between, quite likely again there, picks a position out of that probability distribution and arrives there. So, we have light, as it is now, behaving like a wave. Now this was quite a major change.
physicists were just about managing to get their heads around this when another clever young chap at the time thought, well, if waves behave like particles, what about everything that we've always thought of as particles? Do they also somehow behave like waves? And this was a Frenchman called Now this apparently is pronounced Louis de Broglie, not Broglie, de Broglie. I don't know why he was French, ask the French. But he suggested in his PhD thesis that particles, that if waves, if things that we always thought of as waves can also behave like particles, then particles perhaps should also behave like waves. And he suggested that the wavelength of these particles, lambda, the wavelength, is equal to h, Planck's constant, over p, the momentum of the particle. Now if that's the case, h by the way, Planck's constant is a really tiny number, so this gives very very small values for the wavelength. Now if you remember that the wave features of light were only discovered by using very small slits because the wavelength of light is very very small and you have to have the distance between the slits is roughly the same as the wavelength. So for a stream of particles like let's say electrons using this equation gives them a very small wavelength round about the size of the spacing of atoms in a solid the distance between adjacent atoms. Now you can't just cut two slits that big, but what we can do is create a beam of electrons, E for electrons there, and send that through a crystal. So here we have atoms in a crystal, regularly spaced. where, if this theory is correct, these gaps between the layers of atoms will act like a series of slits for the electron waves that Louis has suggested exist. Now if that's not true, if electrons are just little balls, little particles, they'll go straight through and they'll either come out of the gaps, or more likely they'll bounce off the atoms and come out all over the place, random directions. So just take those off. If they are behaving in some way like a wave, then we'll get the interference pattern. Let's go back to that. Here, series of constructive and destructive interference. Except, of course, that this crystal isn't just a series of slits, it's in two dimensions, as in there are layers going sideways and then there are layers going up. So what we find we do get is, here is the screen that we're going to collect the results on. We find that as the electrons go through, you get a pattern like this, which is exactly what you would expect if the electrons are behaving like a wave. So you get an interference pattern left to right and interference pattern up and down. So this looks exactly like the one we had on the previous page, sorry here in two dimensions. Thus proving, and the spacing by the way between these patches fits exactly what you would expect for the wavelength predicted by this equation.
So he was proved right, which is why later on he was awarded the Nobel Prize. Clever guy. So now we have light behaves like a wave and behaves like a particle. And we call the particles of light photons. Electrons behave like particles, as in they always arrive at a specific place, but they behave like a wave, as in they always arrive and only arrive where the wave interference equations say they're allowed to. Turns out this is true for just about everything. Well, just about. It is true for everything. You could do it with any other particles. You can send a beam of uh, protons through, for example, some kind of atomic grating like this, and you'll get interference patterns. The reason we don't tend to see this with bigger particles is if you look at this equation again, Bigger particles have a bigger mass. Bigger mass means a bigger momentum, the p here. And the bigger that is, because you're dividing by it, the smaller the wavelength. So you have to use smaller and smaller gratings, smaller and smaller gaps to send the, the things through in order to see the wave behavior. And of course, with bigger particles, you rapidly get to the point where the size of the particles themselves is too big, so you can't send them, you can't create slits that they can both fit through and that will give you a small enough spacing to get the wave effect. So, we are now in the position, in our understanding of physics, that everything, as in there is no such thing as a wave or a particle, everything behaves in some, to some degree or other as both a wave and as a particle wave-particle duality. Now, I hope that has helped to explain the ideas a little bit. If you have any questions or comments, then feel free to get back to me and I will look at going into them in a future session. Thank you.